So thanks for the invitation to come here. It's a particular pleasure to be um, between, it's, it's daunting, but it's a pleasure to be between um, Andre and Tony as the, um, uh, as the speakers. Both of them have our you know, sort of rock star status in our MBA venture capital and private equity class as guests. So it definitely makes it daunting. So given this title of what's the evolving world of private equity, I started making slides. And at some point, I got up to around 98 slides and realized that with um, 20 minutes to talk or 25 minutes to talk, I wasn't going to be able to deal with everything I wanted. So I threw, I still put together way too much stuff. Um, but let's not stand in the ceremony. If people have stuff as they're sort of going along, you can do it Harvard style and just jump in and um, interrupt and say, yo, Josh, stop. I don't believe that number or whatever. And we can um, you know, sort of dig, dig into it a little bit there. And if we get too far astray, I'll just, um, you know, just sort of plunge ahead. So um, let's start with the good news. You said best of times and worst of times. The good news is clearly that when we sort of think about that's, that's Charles Dickens, by the way, since we were on our Tale of Two Cities theme here. That, you know, we sort of go back to the time machine five years ago, and there was certainly an enormous amount of prediction that private equity was just about to go over its cliff, right? That it was going to be, you know, a total catastrophe. And it's clear that that hasn't happened. That basically the private equity model really has been validated, and I think a lot of the enthusiasm we heard from CPP and other institutions about private equity really sort of goes back to the fact that this is really work. Now, I'd like to say everything is wonderful, but as we'll see, there are a few catches along the way that we'll need to sort of get into. Now you say, why was everyone so, um, you know, so pessimistic in 2000, 2009, right? Um, you know, a lot of it was sort of conditioned on the experience that had taken place in the 1980s, right? During the 80s, we'd seen this enormous boom of activity, you know, essentially a 60-fold boost in terms of deal, deal value. All the kind of, you know, sort of pathologies that we sort of associate with overheated markets from, you know, cheap debt, rising valuations, uh, you know, super levered deals and all that, you know, all of that was there. And then we saw this sort of extremely ugly bust, which essentially where the volume of underwriting dropped by, you know, essentially, uh, essentially 12-fold or something along those lines. And what's clear is that, that was sort of a, you know, the going off the cliff was tremendously bad for deals in that period. So if you look at our, you know, the sort of the first half of the boom, the 80 to 84 period, you know, we were essentially talking about only a handful of few large deals going off the cliff, just a few percent. When you look at the sort of the boom years, the sort of equivalent of 06 and 07, namely the deals done in, you know, 86 and 87, you know, essentially we were talking about around 40% of the deals going through major ugly defaults, which clearly set the industry back for many years and had, you know, sort of profound consequences for people's willingness to invest. So it's not surprising that lots of people, um, you know, sort of just sort of played the movie forward and said, this is going to, you know, here we go again, we're going to see these huge wave of defaults, you know, conversing through the industry. You know, so essentially just, you know, this is deja vu all over again. And we could look at EBITDA or whatever. There's just sort of lots of technical reasons for saying this thing is going to repeat. You know, this is sort of just the most notorious of the predictions, the ECG study, right, from uh, December 2008, you know, which basically predicted that 40% of private equity firms are going to be out of business in three years. Well, as we know, that didn't happen. That's the danger of looking at the crystal ball, right? Uh, or if you do, better not put it in print. Um, you, know, we, you know, if you look at the sort of number of, you know, look at the mega deals, this is just from, you know, sort of one compilation economists did of a, where they consider the 20 largest deals, which is an impossibly small font. We'll send the slides around. You know, but essentially, of those 20 deals, you basically have two. Archstone and TXU, which went through classic defaults by the definition we used before, that's a lot less than 40%. Yes, there were debt restructurings and other kinds of things, but using that sort of same criterion as the earlier study, it's vastly smaller the kind of damage that was done. And obviously, a lot of these companies subsequently went public or were sold. 
That's the negatives, but if you, even if you look at the middle market, one sees you know, surprising strength. So there's a fascinating study done last year looking at middle market companies and comparing the private equity backed ones to their sort of counterparts, which weren't private equity backed. And again, you see a lot of ind indications that you know, essentially the default rate was actually lower on, the, in, on a sort of let the apples to apples basis. And even the deals where you would think there would be, you know, sort of where there'd been leverage recaps and all this kind of stuff, all of those sort of warning signs, one didn't see the kind of ugly numbers, the ugly numbers there. So I think, you know, we could spend a bunch of time talking about why this is and, you know, um, that's that. All right, let me just say one other point, right? Which is if you look at private equity performance, you know, there are a lot of finance professors out there, so we try to make things as complicated as possible. So we don't like looking at IRRs and multiples, and we tend to sort of use things like public market equivalents, right? Which is the notion of how well did private equity do relative to the public markets? And essentially, you get that you know sort of across the board, you know, private equity has outperformed public markets. It was true in the 80s. It was true for the funds in the 90s. It was true for the funds in 2000. In fact, the 2000s are even you know, typical fund was even stronger than the ones of the 80s and 90s, right? So you have lots, lots of good news out there. Now you could sort of, we could spend a lot of time, you know, sort of dissecting this and sort of looking back and saying, is this because the private equity guys were so brilliant, or is this does the industry really just deserve to buy a giant bouquet and deliver it to former Chairman Bernanke for having saved the bank? And you know, the answer is yes and yes, right? You know, on the one hand, clearly there were a bunch of macroeconomic things that were probably a lot more favorable than was anticipated playing out in 2009, which clearly very much helped the industry. But it's also the case that there was, you know, essentially a lot of the things that the private equity guys always said they did. We, when things get bad, we roll up our sleeves and work with companies and this and that, you know, actually turned out to be really the case. And there was, you know, essentially what could have been a real route, uh, you know, was, um, was, was not. So that's all the good news. We can sort of pat ourselves on the back and say, everything is wonderful. But this would be a very boring speech if it was just all about you know, how wonderful things are. So I'm going to highlight three issues. And clearly, we're going to have to talk about each of these in a sort of compressed way that could certainly re reward a lot more discussion. Uh, and just sort of touch on three big questions that I see as sort of not about the past, but really about the future of where the industry is going, all of which sort of raise significant issues. So the first of these has to do with the money. And I think, you know, Andre's talk, you know, sort of teed this one up brilliantly. Um, you know, we know that today, you know, you sort of want, if you live this sort of vag vagabond life like I do, you sort of wander off to various places talking to various LPs. You see, everyone's got the same, sing the same song, right? They're like, we're going to start doing our own investments. We just want to be like those groovy Canadians have our own office and do lots of, you know, lots of direct investments and have all our capability to uh, to do this to do this stuff, right? And you know, uh, it's vulgar to quote the competition's numbers in a, uh, an event, but uh, just ignore that little <coughs> p word there. And you know, we just know that there is, um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of enormous amount of interest on this entire in building. And in some sense, you can say this is very understandable, right? Um, you know, this is from you know. One of the uh, studies that was done looking at partnership economics by a couple of professors at Wharton, where they they worked quite closely with Hamilton Lane and tried to back out as carefully as they could what the expenses of running a partnership really were. This is not twenty million dollar seed funds. These are basically you know roughly the two hundred and fifty largest funds which were raised during the golden periods. So these are big buyout, big venture funds. But, and, you know, they, they had to make lots of assumptions along the way that's there. But what is, they essentially figured out, you know, what's the leftover, what's the gravy, and they sort of put it in a number which was essentially the net present value per partner per fund. Put another way, in a sort of simple way to sort of view it is, this is the, che the check arriving in the mailbox of each of the GPs on the day the fund closes. Now, of course, it doesn't really come that day is strung out over the next dozen years, but essentially this is put in, in present value terms. And there's a couple things that um, you know, are interesting about these numbers, you know, one of which is you know, these are significant, particularly when we think about you know, sort of the fact that you know, during much this period, people were raising funds every two or three years. 
you know, if I was a French Marxist economist, I'd probably go on riffing about this theme for quite a while. But I'm more, you know, from the jaded perspective of Harvard Business School, I guess I'm more sort of struck by this number rather than anything else, right? When we go around and teach, when we teach our MBAs, we say, right, there's that little management fee to keep the lights on, and then the carried interest, which provides all the motivation in terms of what's going on. And it's not that the carry isn't there, but it's relative to the management fees, we're talking about you know, roughly around you know, $1 out of every $3 in the form of compensation on a present value adjusted basis coming in the form of the contingent stuff that's really supposed to be providing the motivation. And two, two out of every three hours coming in the form of the bond-like stuff that you're going to get anyway or not. This is probably not what people had in mind when you know, George Dorio designed the first, first private equity fund in 1946 and said, I want to have an incentive share of what's going on, right? So you can see why, I mean, you see why you know, across the board, whether sovereigns or family offices or whatever, saying, we want to sort of, we like, we love private equity, we think this is a great thing, we're not sure we like this deal, and we want to be looking at alternatives. The problem is not so much the critique, which I think is right on, but whether the alternatives are going to be any better, right? So we just did an effort to try to look at this. We got seven large limited partners who, on conditions of anonymity, threw their data in the pot and said, look very carefully at how our investments do, benchmarking and using all the kind of modern tools that you know, finance, finance nerds use to try to look at uh, private equity performance and stuff like that. Um, you know, these are mostly big guys and so forth. So what do you find? Well, I think the first thing you find is that the good news is it beats the public markets. The direct investments do better than the there's only one caveat that we make, which is that when you think about private equity in general, there's been a lot of research that shows that private equity funds also beat the public markets. So the way maybe the comparison you shouldn't be doing is private equity fund in direct deals to public markets, but direct deals to partnerships. And when you do that comparison of direct deals to partnerships, we're doing everything on a net basis. So after, and clearly the stuff that's direct is going to have a lower drag in terms of fees and carry and so forth, we see that you know, there's a couple of things that are a little less appealing. Uh, one of them is that institutions playing the venture direct game, it's a disaster. The second one is, okay, we're not going to venture. The second one is a little more problematic, which is that essentially when, during the 1990s, when relatively few people were doing direct investing, performance was pretty good. Numbers look quite nice. As you get into the 2000s, when there's more and more entry into direct investing, performance seems to deteriorate considerably. That, like many other forms of alternative investing, as you get more activity, it seems to have some adverse, adverse, adverse effects. The final thing, which is sort of most was most surprising and striking to us, that Andre hinted at in his, in his last question, has to do with which investments do best. And in particular, we thought going in that it would be the ones where they're co-investing with private equity guys where you get the best performance. Because there you have the big brother who's going to be you know, sort of rolling up their sleeves if things get ugly and stepping in and doing all this kind of stuff. And remember, you know, certainly for you know, the larger institutions, they're, they're typically co-investing on a very low fee or no fee, no carry kind of, kind of basis. But instead, what we found is that the co-investments did considerably poorer than, than, the, than the fund investments. In fact, one of the most dramatic numbers we found is this. The chart is incomprehensible, but the bottom line is really striking. What we did is we compared the co-investments that our guys did with the performance of the same funds they co-invested with. Right? Now remember, one is going to be with very low fee, low carry. One is going to be two and 20, or one and a half and 20. And what we thought almost, almost by definition, we'd end up getting that the co-investments did better for the LPs than the fund investments. Instead, what we found is that they did 8% a year worse. We found this number, we were just sort of shocked, and we were like, we better go back, we must have misprogrammed the minus or something like that, somewhere in there. No, it's really there. 
And we dug into it and we said, why is it that there seems to be this relatively poor performance of home investments? We saw there were a couple things going on. First of all, we know that in general, private equity tends to be sort of a bunch of investment. It tends to be focused in, you know, times with, when we look at most LPs, they put most of the dollars to work in periods that with the benefit of hindsight is when you should have been sitting on the sideline rather than investing. It's tragic, it's not unique to private equity, but that's certainly one of the factors. If you look at the co-investments, these were sort of super bunched, really focused in terms of venture stuff in 1999 or buyout deals in 2007, and exactly the you know, super concentrated in the long periods. The second pattern we saw, we saw, was that these tended to be, and again, this is probably more by, almost by definition, rather than by some, you know, somebody trying to do some, some sort of conspiratorial kind of view of this. These tended to be the largest deals the fund was doing. That the typical co-investment deal was three times larger than the typical deal done by the same fund they were co-investing That's not surprising, right? That's where they need to fill out the, fill out the, you know, fill out the dance card, they're gonna pick up the phone and call their son. But one of the sort of sad empirical regularities in private equity research is it's not clear that big funds do better or worse than large funds. Some periods they do better and sometimes they do worse than somewhere. But if one looks at the sort of typical fund, the largest deal that fund does whether it's a middle market fund or a mega fund, tends to do worse than the median sized fund. That they're seeing, whether it's psychology or you know, deal dynamics, whatever it is, it seems that somehow big is not beautiful when it comes to looking across the fund. So essentially what one gets is there's this sort of adverse selection, not because of some sort of conspiracy, but just simply from the mathematics of how deals work that tends to push these guys in this direction. And instead, you know, the performance of the direct deals was better. A lot of that, though, not surprisingly, was, you know, there was a strong local effect, right? That the strongest performance seemed to be, you know, an institution investing in the same country in the same region, rather than, you know, sort of going overseas to do the, do the, do the investments, right? So, you know, I, mean, what, I think what I take away from this is that while the diagnosis of the problems that's motivating this interest in direct investing is very understandable, whether this, whether the cure is really going to solve the problem or it's going to sort of introduce a whole other set of issues in their own right is probably some food for thought. I got there. Uh, just so I just wanted to ask the EPP yeah. whether they did better on the direct deals right. or on the right. Right. So, so that's kind of opposite of what you're. Well, we'll, we'll let's 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 cold call Andre afterwards uh, on this thing. But I think what you know, what, what certainly there's not an enormous difference in terms of direct investments in general and fund investments in general across these seven institutions. If you look over the long haul, where the real difference really comes into is this pattern over time, and then you know where you sort of see a lot of the success not from co-investments, but rather from solo deals. And, you know, from having written a couple cases about CPP, certainly one thing we know about them is they're not shy about doing solo deals as a form of activity. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, where did you get your data for the direct investments? So this was essentially the kind of project that was what I described as a friend of Josh project. That's a very technical term. But basically, I wanted the globe going to various institutional investors, groveling, saying, if we can get a bunch of people like you to do this, would you throw your data in the pot? And you know, there's obviously the, you know, there were a number of sovereign wealth funds or others that said, great idea, go get the data from everyone else and come back and tell us what you find. <laughs> I was like, guys, haven't you heard of you know, this common good problem? Someone's got to jump in the pool. But eventually, with um, you know, 18 months of cajoling and groveling, 
we got this sort of critical mass of groups to throw into this. We tried to do a bunch of benchmarking, comparing it to, for instance, the direct deals as reported in Capital IQ or the Thompson database to try to see whether the composition looked similar. And the answer was it did on the gross on these gross measures like what percentage of deals went bankrupt or, or IPO. But in a way, you know, these study, you know, private equity research is groping in the dark and it's always going to be a challenge. Uh, I promised to um, talk about three topics. I've got five minutes and 50 seconds left. I'm only on topic one. Fortunately, the next two are short. Um, the second big question I pose is about operational stuff, right? So we know that private equity guys will say operations is a big thing and a big capability. We know there's been big investments in this area. But it's not, when we look at the data, it's not quite as reassuring as we might like. So here are two recent studies done, one done by McKinsey, we're using their inside data, the other done, used by academics, using large publicly traded companies. You know, certainly if we believed what we read in private placement memorandum, we conclude that maybe 90% of the value of the value creation overall was from operational improvements. When they tried to look very carefully at these numbers in a systematic way, the answer was, yes, it's there, the red stuff. But we're talking about basically 20%, 25%. In other words, there's sort of an omen of this thing, which seems to be the crucial part of the recipe as being important, but an awful lot of it seems to be driven by whatever you call it, good timing, the ability to use debt, to leverage up returns and you know, do recapitalizations and stuff like that. Stuff which may not be there going forward if we think we're moving into a, you know, a more unstable macroeconomic environment and the, and, the, and the like. Moreover, when you look at over time, what you see is a fairly interesting pattern. So essentially, it's not, if you look at the sort of typical deal done, this is from some work we did using the product, basically using the very detailed tax records and other things from uh, the IRS and Census Bureau as part of this World Economic Forum project. Well, we were able to measure productivity on a factory by factory level and compare the private equity back firms with the other ones. The productivity gains are there. In general, the typical private equity backed firm factory grows like 1% faster productivity per year than this, the comparable, comparable company which for a lot of these companies doing you know, metal bending in old industries, 1% productivity added gains, that's a big, big, big difference. But it's very uneven over time, which is to say in the good years, in the golden years, like you know, the mid-2000s, there's, there's very little productivity gains that you see. In the uglier years, like the late 2000s, you see much more in terms of productivity gains. And it seems that in some sense, this has been very, in, the, the kind of value creation seems to be very inconsistent when people apparently can make money doing financial re recapitalizations and releveraging and all that kind of stuff. It tends to focus on that. When they really need to roll up their sleeves, they can do it. But certainly it's not consistent in the kind of way that, uh, again, we might, we might believe. And certainly we see inconsistencies across firms. It's clear this is sort of still a, 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 you know, an area of discovery. So I think one at least concern we might raise is saying that if we believe, and certainly from reading private placement memoranda, certainly limited partners believe and general partners are telling them that operational improvements are absolutely critical. When we look at the actual data, it seems to be a little less consistent in terms of how much of this stuff is there and how broadly it's being applied. And again, this is just in the spirit of raising questions, but we might wonder a little bit saying, you know, if this stuff is really the secret sauce, can the industry, you know, really apply it and put it to work in, uh, in a way? The final issue that I throw out, which I'll give in abbreviated form, this is a topic which anyway we could spend, you know, a day and a half discussing and not exhaust, is about where the pool of deals are, whether the pool of deals are going to be still there, or whether in some sense there's been a you know a sort of harvesting of the uh, harvesting of the um, you know the, the greatest opportunities in certain more challenges, more challenges there. You know, so we've obviously seen you know less traditional deals in some sense. Here I just put the uh, Beats deal as an example. It doesn't 
Dr. Dre in the bottom, bottom right and the parallel guys above. He said, well, that clearly ended happily. But certainly, it's, I think it's probably fair to say that we wouldn't characterize Dr. Dre as the sort of standard issue Carlisle entrepreneur by, uh, by, many, uh, by, many, uh, by many metrics. I think you know, maybe sort of more interesting is you know, sort of thinking about you know, some of the stuff that's, for instance, the TPD, TPG strategy over the last you know, 18 months, where we've seen a whole series of investments done in the um, you know, tech space and later stage venture rounds. Saying, well, that's certainly, I mean, I put a quote here from Jim Coulter saying, we're, we've returned to what private equity does well, which you get, I guess in some sense you can say, you can sort of accept it, but you're saying, well, if you think about it, it's hard to really think about Uber or Airbnb as being a traditional private equity deal by many metrics. Similarly, we could sort of think about, you know, funds like Carlisle going off and doing the Sub Saharan Africa Fund and so forth clearly got very strong, you know, very strong uptake. And again, ask the question, this is clearly going beyond the sort of traditional realm in terms of, uh, in terms of what, these, what these deals entail. And it's certainly an interesting question to say, is this a case of style drift where groups having found that it's really hard to do deals in their core market, you have to get into other things where it may not work very well? Or is this a case where the private equity model is really sort of successfully morphing and transforming itself in other ways? Lots of food for thought, and with that, I will bring my uh, talk to an end, and we can, um, if we have a couple minutes for questions, yeah, we can sort of field any, uh, field any questions. Hey there, thank you. Yes, Professor, um, you put a couple of the, uh, the busts, uh, busted deals, the bank deals, right? Right. Right. And a lot of folks are Right. Right. Well, so certainly one of the big problems with the or one of the dis, one of the big drivers of disappointing returns from co-investments really does have to do with this bunching into big deals done at market peaks. And again, you know, it's not. I don't regard this as some sort of conspiracy on the part of general partners saying, "Oh, this is a really bad market. We can really." screw over our LPs by doing this. It's just, when is it that you're going to need help completing deals? It's probably during the periods when you're doing a lot of deals and when you're, you're doing the sort of largest, largest deals that are out there. And you know, again, you, you can sort of look at that piece of the performance. You say, that really drags things down. Similarly, if you go and look at the venture side, you know, there were a number of deals done which involved a lot of co-investments in 99 and 2000. Again, you know, we can bring back the rogues gallery of um, uh, rogues gallery of uh, large transactions during that period, which you know sort of flamed out, um, flamed out spectacularly. And I think that you know it, it just seems to be, for whatever reason, the way in which the mechanics of co-investment seem to work seems to drive activity into these, into these, um, into these, um, into these, into these periods, and into these particular. Of kinds, of kinds of things. And again, maybe the market will innovate and sort of address this issue in a variety of ways, but it certainly seems to be one of the challenges that at least historically, given what we can do in terms of looking in the rear view mirror, is drag down the performance that's there. Yeah. yeah. You have a quick question. Uh, have you done any analysis of firms that tend to specialize in one or more particular right. industries? So the question was really about specialization, and whether specialization seems to be associated with better returns. And you know, as in most things, the answer is sort of. Uh, you, you certainly see that in general, specialized firms do better than non-specialized firms. When you look a level deeper, what seems to be driving a lot of this is that you essentially see that organizations where the partners are specializing seem to do much better than the cases where the partners are you know, sort of moving across deals and transaction types and so forth. That the real you know, recipe for disaster, for instance, in the venture realm, is the partner who says, I know how to do semiconductor deals, so I'll go and do, that's about silicon, so I'll go and do a solo deal. That's really when you get to that, it's not so much within the partnership, but really within the individuals as you see them branching out of different industries, geographies, and the like, that's a real recipe. I'm out of here, Mark. Thank you, Josh. <laughs>